you would, to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, we'll read the first 12 verses of the third chapter of um, the book of Exodus, uh, one of the great books of the Pentateuch, as we think of it, uh, something that uh, for many years uh, biblical scholars have accredited to Moses as far as the author is concerned. Uh, there's some debate about that, but I, I'm not someone who can uh, debate it. I just uh, accept it as the word of God and go on about my business. This is a story that I'm sure you have maybe read and maybe a story that you have seen even depicted in cinema. Uh, the, the Ten Commandments, for example, is an example of, of remembering Charleston Heston as he takes the shoes off of his feet and as he approaches uh, that bush that is burning but is not consumed. Well, um, when Moses approached it, I don't think he looked like Charleston Heston, although I, I can't say for sure, can you? Uh, but we know that he was a mortal man being called by God and equipped by God to do something that God needed him to do. And at the same time, he was preparing a people to make a journey that they needed to make. And this all kind of came together under these circumstances. Now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, that is Sinai, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. It's a strange way for God to get the attention of his servant. But it was very visual. Perhaps even, it was even audible as you could hear the crackling sound and the sound of the fire. Yet the amazing thing was he was looking at something that didn't make any sense. It didn't make sense to him. When a bush is on fire, naturally, a dry bush in the wilderness would very quickly be consumed, but it wasn't happening in this case. Something else was happening. And it got his attention, God got his attention, through something that didn't make any sense. And I wonder, has God ever called you to a place in your life that didn't make any sense to you, but it was exactly where God wanted you to be? Well, that's where Moses is. He's exactly where God wants him to be. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. If God is there, wherever God is, that's a holy place. I believe this is a holy place. It's not like other buildings that you might go to in the city of Ava. It's not like Walmart. It's not like town and country. It's, it's not like even the school. This is a holy place. It ought to be treated like a holy place. God says, this is where, this is where I am. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their suffering. So we see that God knew what was going on there in Egypt. Now, this is a remarkable thing because, remember, this is on what we think of now as the Sinai Peninsula. And they were, and Moses was, was there out of the country of Egypt. 
And in this day and time, unlike how we think now, in this day and time, people pretty much thought of their gods as being local deities. So you would have a god that would be over a particular area. Uh, sometimes even there were gods of the fields and gods of the mountains. So you wouldn't think that a god of the fields or a god of the mountains to have any jurisdiction as we would think over it over somewhere else. But here, this God that has called Moses is saying, I know what's going on in Egypt. I hear the cries of my people who are in Egypt. I know what's happening in their lives. I'm listening to them. I'm aware of it very well. So Moses, now let's have this conversation. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have taken heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Pezzarite, and the Hivite, and the Jubasite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. And he said, Certainly I will be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that it is I who sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. Now, with this statement, God is saying to Moses, I have already done this. It's a done deal. I am going to make this happen. And if you are Moses now, you need this statement because you're going to face the Red Sea and you're going to face a stiff-necked people that will resist your leadership and you will face the anger of Pharaoh and you will face his armies. You will face all of those things. You need this statement because God is saying, Moses, this is a done deal. I'm going to make this happen. As a matter of fact, in, in my holy mind, it's already happened. But I'm sending you as my servant and my representative. Go. Go. When you have brought the people out of Egypt... <coughs> You shall worship God at this mountain. May the Lord today add his blessings to the reading of his word. I want you to go back to last week if you were, if you were here. And I want you to think about the title of my sermon last week. And the title of my sermon was in the form of a question in case you have forgotten. And the question was, do you like change? And I think the consensus is no, I really don't like change. I would prefer for things to say just as they are. After all, I'm comfortable where I am in my life. Things are going pretty well for me. If I could just make, if I could just keep, what was it, the old song, if I could just keep time in a bottle, I would be very happy to do that. Or even better, if I could go back into the past, into my past, and reclaim some of my precious values that used to be there. If we could just go back to Mayberry and walk with Andy and Barney for a while, uh, if we could go back to Matlock and watch um, Matlock for a while. Oh, by the way, you can do that now, can't you? I called my mom. Uh, I try to call her every once in a while, uh, sometimes late in the evening, just to kind of break up her evening. And I call her and I say, hey, Mom, what are you doing about 9 o'clock? She said, well, I just got through watching Matlock. I said, what are you going to do tomorrow night? I'm going to watch Matlock. 
That's, that's what she enjoys doing. She enjoys going back to the Waltons and to Matlock and to, and to, and to Barney and, and to Andy Griffith and to all those things. If we could just go back and reclaim those things in our life and bring them up to where we are now, I think we would be pretty content if we could do that. But saying all that, this is what we know. What we know is that change is always in our life. Some change is thrust upon us and we have to deal with it when it comes. Other change can be very deliberate and managed as we look towards the future and we think, well, what's going to happen next or what's going to happen as we go along. We know that life is not static. And while it's true that our life is comfortable, and even the discomforts that we might experience now in our mind might be preferable to the unknowns of the future. So just let me stay as I am. And yet we know in our heart we can. I was talking to a young pastor yesterday. By the way, I learned a great deal from him because his perspective of our community is new and, and he's looking at things through fresh eyes, we, we kind of begin to notice things through our eyes. Matter of fact, I went to a conference one time led by Andy Stanley and, and Ken Kroeschel. And one of the things that I wrote down in my book that he said, he said, if you're a leader of an organization and you've been in that organization more than five years, you don't have a clue what's going on. And the reason is, is because we simply adjust. We adjust to what's going on in our lives. We adjust to what's going on in an organization. We don't see the flaws anymore. We, we, don't, see that, we don't see that the grass isn't cut or, 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 the, or, or the sign isn't painted or uh, that the coffee isn't. We, we, just, we just start adjusting, and we don't see those things anymore. But let somebody new come in, and they begin to say, but why, and but why, and but why, and but why? And then we get irritated with the why. But one of the things this young man said was, he said, last year, the church I pastor, the average age of the congregation decreased by eight years. He said, not because new people came in that were younger, but because we lost many of our older ones. And change happens, doesn't it? Do you know what? That's happening in our community. That's happening in this church. We're seeing it happen right before our very eyes. Change is a constant, a, a constant in our life and something that we have to deal with as we live. Then we run on to those people. I had a funeral service for one of them yesterday that seems to embrace change. They seem to like change. They view it as an opportunity. They view it as a challenge. They view it as something that can inspire them and motivate them. And, and they look forward to it. I was always, I was always so impressed with Dick Walker. Um, my, my good friend Dick Walker that was a part of our church. Um, in, in case you've forgotten, he was a colonel in the United States Air Force. Um, he was a World War II veteran, a, a Korean veteran, a Vietnam veteran. Uh, he was on duty at Offutt Air Force Base whenever the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. And he said he was on duty that night when they saw a blip come up from Cuba. And for a second, just a second, they thought that the Soviets had fired a nuclear missile at the United States. And they were ready to respond until he said, we decided very quickly, no. It's a false read because they would not fire one missile. They would have fired everything they had. He said, we were that close to nuclear war. And he said, I am one of the few people in the world that knew it. Now, that's an interesting man, isn't it? And I noticed as, as Dick lived his life, one of the things he did was adjust to change. He was one of the guys that was surfing the Internet before anybody, a lot of people even realized what it was to surf the internet. And he was trading stocks online before other people realized you could do that. And the reason was is because it seemed that, that change and it seemed that 
uh, the, the things that were going on in his life that we would think of as change was something he could embrace and something he wanted to bring into his life because he knew it was going to happen. And he wanted to be on the cutting edge of it. Change. I wonder, I wonder as I think about change, I wonder, is there a reason for a church or a community to change? And sometimes I wonder what kind of changes really need to happen in a community or a person's life or a church simply to move through life, to remain true to the Lord, to be true to the gospel, but still to adjust and to move on. And then I begin to wonder, well, what would make people want to change as individuals, as communities, or churches? And, and by that I mean deliberately, willfully change. I think one reason may be very simple. I have noticed this in my own life. I've noticed this in the lives of other people that I have talked to. And I have witnessed this in organizations. We want to change, it seems, when the pain or the cost of change is less than the pain or the cost of remaining the same. When it becomes so painful to remain the same, then we are willing to change. Now let me say that clearly. When the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change, then we are willing to change. And let me tell you what, there is often pain associated not just with change, but with also remaining the same in our life. Pain can motivate change. Listen to this scripture. Uh, this is a scripture that I found in 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 3. Very interesting scripture. The background of this is now that the uh, Syrians have laid siege to Samaria. And siege warfare was a horrible way to fight wars, but very effective in many ways. All you had to do is surround a walled city, cut their food supply off, and wait them out. That's all you had to do. Romans did it very well. The, the Greeks did it very well. The Syrians did it very, very, very well. And now Samaria has been surrounded. And it has gotten so bad in the city that people have literally resorted to cannibalism. Horrible. Horrible conditions. Today we do something similar to it. It's called sanctions. If a nation misbehaves, we simply apply sanctions to them and we say, all right, we won't buy your corn, we won't buy your grain, we won't buy your oil. We will literally shut you off from the world economically until you start adjusting your behavior. That's kind of like a siege warfare, but this was much more personal and this had a terrible effect on the lives of people that were surrounded. So here the people of, uh, uh, of Amaran or the people of Syria had surrounded the people of Samaria. And just outside the gate of that city, there were four lepers. Now out here is the enemy. Inside is the city. And this is where they sit. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. And they said one to another, why do we sit here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, then the famine is in the city and we will die there. And if we sit here, we will die also. Now that's a pretty bad place to be in, isn't it? If I stay here, I will die. Men, if we sit here, we will die. If we go into the city, we will die in the city. What are we going to do? Now therefore come. Let us go over to the camp of the Syrians. If they spare us, we will live. And if they kill us, we will but die. 
These four men were in a horrible condition. They're kind of like the people in Egypt that were in slavery. Because everywhere they looked, they saw death, they saw misery, they had very few good options. They looked at the city and saw death by starvation. If there was any food in the city at all, you would think it would be very unlikely that the people of the city would be inclined to take their very, very sparse amount of food that they might be able to consume themselves or give to their children and give it to a bunch of filthy, dirty, leper, sinners people. So here they are in this, in this horrible situation. By the way, those lepers weren't supposed to be in the city in the first place. And these slaves in Egypt? Let's go back and think of them for a moment. Their choice was either to remain where they were and to wake up every day as slaves, driven by their slave masters, or leave. But how would they leave? These four lepers must have become desperate and driven by the pain of their circumstances. And that pain motivated them to start asking a very important question. And that question was, why are we sitting here? Why are we staying where we are in our lives? This isn't working for us. And the people in slavery, they must have known that they simply were unable to free themselves from their condition. But their condition was miserable. So what did they decide to do? By the way, these people in slavery, how did they get there? How did this happen? Well, if you look back into their life history, you will find that at one time where they were living, it was actually a place of refuge. They had gone there to live. They had gone there because there was a famine where they were. And in Egypt, there was food because of the wisdom of Joseph. When they, gone, when they had made that journey down to the land of Goshen, everything was great. Life was good for them. As a matter of fact, the land of, of Goshen had offered them peace and prosperity and opportunity. So many good things was there, and for a long time, everything kind of rocked along, and it was, it was going real well. Then something happened, and that something was change. You know what happened? A king arose that did not know Joseph. A king came to power, a pharaoh came to power that knew very little about his history. And he started looking around at these foreigners in his land, and he noticed that they were doing very well and they were multiplying and they were growing in power. And soon these people that were once allies became a threat to him. And he also saw an opportunity to get free labor. They had not built a strong infrastructure of armies and governments. They just lived in peace in Goshen. And when the moment arrived, when this king came to power, well, everything changed. Now, you might wonder, wait a minute, I thought these were God's people. Did God know this was going to happen? Well, as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that God knew all along it was going to happen. Their slavery, he knew, was going to happen. If you go back in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 15, verses 12 through 13, there is a really weird story. Uh, at least it's weird to me. This is a conversation that was going on, or a, and really a monologue that was going on between Abram, and the, the, the father of these people, or, or the ancestral father of these people, and Almighty God. And the Bible tells us now, uh, Abram had just been talking to God, or God had been talking to him, and then this is what happened. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. 
So was this a dream? Was it a nightmare? Something was going on in the mind of the great patriarch. And God was communicating something to him that caused him to have dread and fear in his life. Darkness surrounded him. God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. Pay attention to that. Where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve. And afterward they will come out with many possessions. God doesn't reveal what that nation is at that point. He just simply reassures Abram that his descendants are going to take a journey. And they're going to go to a strange place. And God's going to know everything there is to know about it before it ever happens. And I wonder, how many journeys have you taken in your life? How many journeys has God taken me through in my life? Where at the time I wondered, God, do you even know what's going on? And God knew exactly what was going on. He was simply taking us to, through a journey in our life to get us to a place where he wanted us to be. Yes, God knew. And God waited. And when the people grew weary of their condition, when they could no longer abide the slavery that was now their lot, they began to do something that God knew they would do, but he waited for them to do it, and that is they began to cry out to God. But why would a good God allow them to get in that situation in the first place? How could they honor God as slaves? And why would a good God allow four helpless men to sit in misery of leprosy, hungry and desperate? Well, for the first question, this is the answer. God allowed slavery to happen in their life because they were in a place now where they did not belong. That was not their land. If you go back and listen to what God said to Abram, he told him very clearly, this will be your land. This will be your inheritance. This will be the place where my people, your, your descendants, will live. Egypt wasn't that place. God had a purpose for them going to Egypt. God had a purpose for them being there. But they weren't where God wanted them to be now. They were strangers in a strange land. God hadn't given them the land. He had no intentions for them staying there. He did not want them to be residents of Egypt any longer. But do you really believe the people of Israel would have willingly left the land of Goshen with its flowing streams and its fertile fields had it not been for the fact that they had been subjected to the misery of slavery. For heaven's sakes, even when, when Moses went there, after they cried out to God, after Moses was sent by God and he was obedient to God and he led them out of that place and now they're across the Red Sea and they saw all the miracles. The first time they got thirsty, they began to say to Moses, Why did you lead us out here for us to die in the wilderness? Wasn't there enough graves in Egypt? By the way, there were flesh pots in Egypt and there were cucumbers in Egypt and there were melons in Egypt. And they began to think of all the things they left behind in Egypt. Do you think they would have willingly left? Had they still been enjoying the prosperity and the peace and the security of Goshen? Why, you couldn't have driven them out of there with whips. So what did God do? He allowed change to happen in their life. He allowed them to come to a place in their life where they were so miserable they could no longer stay where they were. Sometimes, folks, this is called conviction. Sometimes this is what happens in our heart and mind when the Holy Spirit begins to speak to us through the Scriptures and say to us, where you're living in your life is not where God wants you to be. Sometimes we think of it as hitting the bottom. Sometimes whenever people are overcome by addictions in their life and, and they're allowing substances and chemicals to control their life, 
There's no way on earth for them to change until finally they get to the place where they are so miserable in their life. And you have to let them get there. You have to love them enough to let them get there. But they finally get to the place where they're so miserable in their life that they're willing to say, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to change. There are some people who it takes a heart attack. It takes a major event in their life before they will finally say, you know what? Uh, these things I'm smoking, they're harming my health and I'm going to throw them away. Or before they start to say, you know, I need to start exercising now and trying to get, uh, to get my, my, my body to where it's not hurting me anymore. And, and it takes those kind of pains and those kind of things in our life to eventually get us to the place. And all along, really, we're saying, God, why is this happening? Why am I suffering like this? Why am I going through this bad time economically in my life? Or why, why am I going through this hard time socially in my life? And you know what? If you look at it carefully and look at it through the light of scriptures, what God is saying is, it's because you're not where I want you to be right now. You're not in a good place in your life. You may be in a comfortable place. You may be in a place that you're familiar with and you really like. But it's not where I want you to be. So there are times, folks, whenever God allows these kind of pains and these kind of difficulties to happen in our life. Sometimes it's because we just, they, they loved Goshen. They just loved Goshen. And I've noticed something. Tim Keller pointed this out in a book that he wrote not too long ago. He said, you know, when God allows pain to come into our life, many times he allows it to attack one of the loves in our life that has taken the proper place for the love we should have for him. And he allows those things to happen. That's what God did here. He allowed the pain of slavery to be a part of their life. So they would eventually cry out to him and they would want to leave. And those lepers, well, we'll learn more about them maybe in a, in a sermon to come. Andy Stanley asked this question. He said, what is the big question? And of course, the, the answer that he gave, and I think it's a really good answer, is this. In every situation, what is the wise thing to do? We need to think about our life circumstances and we need to think about our walk with God and we need to think about who we are as servants before God and whenever we find ourselves in a circumstance in our life that brings discomfort or that brings problems to our life and we're going through those valleys in our life, I think it's good and wise for us to simply stop and say, Lord, what is the wise thing to do here? What do you want me to do? Where are you trying to lead me through this time of difficulty? Hunger is a great motivator. And sometimes, folks, we can find our own lives to be in a place where, like these poor lepers, we're simply craving to know God. We're hungry to know God. But we're looking in all the wrong places. Like the younger brother in the parable of the, uh, the, of the prodigal son, he wanted somebody to give him hog feed, but no one would even give him hog feed. Or we can choose the freedom of service. Paul said this, We are the servant to whom we obey. Romans chapter 6 verses 16 through 18 says, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for, uh, for obedience, you are slaves of the one to whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God, that though you were slaves to sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You know what? There have been times in my life when I was kind of like these slaves. Or there have been times in my life when I could identify with the people in Egypt. But I'm glad that God sent someone even better than Moses. I'm glad that he sent me the Lord Jesus Christ that gave up everything to rescue me and to bring me to a better place, even through my times of pain and even through times of change. Let's stand together.
Heavenly Father, as we approach you this morning, we realize that there are times in our life when things can get very uncomfortable for us. Sometimes there are times when communities go through times of agonizing change. Whenever the factory moves out, whenever businesses close, whenever people are faced with decisions that offer very few good options. And Heavenly Father, I know in my own life personally, and perhaps in the lives of the people, your servants who are here today, we have confronted times in our life when we wondered, God, what can we do next? I can't stay where I am. I need to move towards you, O Lord. Heavenly Father, I am so glad that throughout our lives you have always offered us the best option. You've always offered us the best way to go. But because of that, we could not stay where we were. Heavenly Father, help us to see in our own lives that we can get in ruts, that we can become so comfortable we just want to hunker down. But help us, Lord, never to be satisfied where we are unless where we are is where you want us to be. Thank you, God, for the committed people who are here today. I pray, God, you would give them safety as they go home eventually or as they go to Sunday school, God. Give them a great time. And for those who may be coming later, Lord, we just pray that you would keep them safe. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.